hold in, um, we can go ahead and start talking about today's workshop. Um, as I stated before, again, welcome to day three of this year's Beginner Gardener Intensive. Um, I'm Colleen Graves, a school gardens coordinator for the Queens and Staten Island regions of the city. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Kristen, Laura, DK, and Tutu. And we also have a very special guest today um, that I'm quite excited about to introduce shortly, but you can see her briefly, Joanne, waving in the chat. Um, next, please. For those of us who might be unfamiliar with our organization, we are Grow NYC, a nonprofit that works here in the city to protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy, and give them opportunities to make a positive impact. Um, to accomplish this, we work within the realms of education, case in point, the school gardens team, conservation, green spaces, our team that goes out and builds community gardens, food access, and agriculture, our green market programs, and food access boxes. Next, please. Um, for today's workshop, you can see on the screen, please submit your questions using the Q&A function. And we'll have time at the, end of the, at the end of the workshop to answer as many as we can. Uh, we are recording today and tomorrow in a follow-up email to you, you will see the link to the recording along with relevant additional resources. Um, we've also enabled live transcription function today. So if you need this, you can turn it on for your own screen. Um, and so you can see these are our workshop offerings for BGI this year. Uh, we're on day three, but if you did not get to make the previous two workshops, you can find the recordings on our distance learning webpage. Um, and also be sure, be sure to tune in tomorrow for Gardens as Community Hubs, led by Chantel and DK, as you can see. That will be um, sort of our excellent, wonderful workshop to close out this year's Beginner Gardener Intensive Series. So come back for tomorrow at four o'clock. Alrighty, in today's workshop, we're gonna focus on why it's important to focus on healing right now, especially emotional healing that can come forth in the garden. We will highlight the biophilia hypothesis and introduce you to the field of horticultural therapy. Through this, you will learn about who can benefit from this specific arena of therapy and then avenues for incorporating some basics into your own gardening. Next. So why is it important to talk about it today and why have we decided to include it in the beginner gardener intensive? Next, please. Um, we want to acknowledge that these last two years have been particularly difficult for all of us and that overwhelmingly there's a sense of collective, collective trauma that we're feeling. During the main period of the shutdown brought about by the pandemic, we witnessed that people the world over needed to be outside in nature. We sought out national parks, state parks, city parks, playgrounds, and here in the city, folks flocked to open streets that had been closed to cars, but open for the people to just be outside and breathe deeply. People also turned to gardening in droves, buying out stores of gardening supplies, seeds, and plants. People grew and grew, but why? What did we find in our time outside? What did our souls need from time with nature? And how specifically did the act of gardening, whether it was on a windowsill, a stoop, a raised bed, or a large garden, satisfy this? How can time in the garden heal us? So for, to answer this question, hold on, Laura, we turn to our guest speaker for today, Joanne Dioria, to lead us through an introduction to the field of horticultural therapy and practices within the profession that are accessible to each of us to utilize in our own gardening practice whether it's individually, with students, with elders? Um, what can these practices, how, how can they help us bring forth deeper levels of healing for various aspects of our own self? Um, Joanne is a horticultural therapist who has worked at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden for 12 years. She coordinated school programs and created an on-site and virtual programs for adults with dementia. She has a horticultural therapy certificate from the New York Botanical Garden. She's served as a steering committee member for the Museum Arts Cultural Access Consortium and as a member of the Mid-Atlantic Horticultural Therapy Network. So welcome, Joanne, and I'm now going to turn it over to you to take us on this journey. 
Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, uh, Kristen and Colleen, for inviting me. I'm very happy to join the conversation this week um, to talk about how to use horticultural therapy practices to help us and our students heal emotionally from the pandemic and all that's happened since. It's been such a very difficult time for all of us. We've experienced loss, anxiety, and confusion, loss of loved ones, loss of connection to others, and loss of our everyday routines. The anxiety and confusion of not understanding what's happening in the world, what's gonna happen next, and not knowing when it's all gonna end. Our children uh, were not only experiencing their own loss and anxiety about friends and family and school, they were also taking cues from us and watching our reactions. So how calm and optimistic were we feeling? And how are we dealing with the pandemic and the recent social events in their eyes? So today we're gonna to talk about connecting with nature as a way of healing, as a way to heal and to feel hopeful. So I'll share with you some information about what is horticultural therapy, a little history, uh, research and current practice, and how to incorporate these practices into your work with students and for yourself with the goal of emotional rehabilitation. So I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, working with students, but think of it in terms of what it means to you and how you can use these practices for yourself because we all, actually what I've seen this past week from these seminars, everybody's an amazing gardener and I've learned so much. So I'm preaching to the choir. I think that you all will have some, uh, will understand what I'm talking about and also have some wonderful suggestions for each other. Next slide is good. So um, first let's get in the mood for nature. Uh, so we're gonna do like a little warm up. Uh, I'd like you to close your eyes. If you can, if you're driving, please don't close your eyes and recall a special time that you spent in nature, either as an adult or in your youth. It could be on a long vacation or a day trip. Focus on what your senses experienced. So what was remarkable about what you saw heard, felt, tasted, and smelled? Did the experience connect with one or many of these senses in an extraordinary way? So let's take a minute to be in that experience. And if you'd like, perhaps you can share a word or phrase about what senses were, um, were touched during this encounter with nature. Maybe you could put it in the chat and we can read some out. I'm just going to grab my phone so that I can time. I'm not leaving. I'm just grabbing my phone. Uh, do know, Joanne, I don't know if you can see the chat, but lots of people are talking about smell, touch and feel, um, the Brooklyn Botanic Scents Garden, smelling lavender, lemon and mint. Ooh, the beach, sense of smell, touch. If anybody wants to share someplace extraordinary that they went, that would be great too. We'll all take a mini vacation there. We have Costa Rica, birds and waterfalls. Oh, wow. I, I did add my own of the smell of the Moroccan Medinas, the spices. Uh, Ooh, farming in the Hudson Valley. I saw something about a salt marsh. Oh, that sounded beautiful. Yeah. Um, an arboretum in Rhode Island, Blythewood Arboretum. Mm. Yeah. Smell of trees, perhaps, there. Um, Camino de Santiago. I'm afraid I don't know where that is, but I want to find out. Oh, hiking in the bluffs. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a whole, all of these are multi-sensory experiences, right? We're seeing things, we're smelling things, we're hearing the waves crash to the ocean, we're hearing nature. These are wonderful, wonderful experiences. Oh, the smell of ferns in my face. Oh, that's really great. My own rose garden. Oh, that's so nice. It's right in your backyard. That's lovely. Uh, 
Oh. I love the idea of quiet, of hearing nothing. Oh, I don't think I've heard nothing for a long time, especially since I live in the city. There's so much information, so much noise coming through. Well, thank you so much, everybody. That was great. And I, I think that you all kind of get that feeling of these deep experiences with nature really make these, um, these uh, moments in nature so, so deep and so uh, thrilling. But what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about in the next um, slide <clears throat> about biophilia. So that's the urge to affiliate with other uh, living things. And I don't know, some of you may know E.O. Wilson, who is an American biologist and naturalist. He was considered the father of biodiversity. And he happened to be the world's leading authority on ants, the insects. Unfortunately, he recently passed away, but he wrote many books on these topics, and he refers to a theory called biophilia, which is the human connection to nature. And it's a connection that's in our DNA. While in nature, like a walk in the garden or, uh, or a forest, for example, we experience health benefits like lowered blood pressure, breathing becomes relaxed. We have a feeling of renewal and we feel hopeful. And this connection is instinctual from our prehistoric ancestors who relied on plants for survival, food, shelter, tools, and medicine. Also, burial sites that were found from about 60,000 years ago had corn flowers, yarrow, grape hyacinths, and other flowers placed around the deceased. So perhaps our ancestors saw beauty in nature and used flowers to show emotion and sentiment like we do. But how do we know this plant people connection is real? So let's go to the next slide and I'm gonna share some evidence-based research. Um, in 1984, Dr. Roger Ehrlich, who is a professor uh, of architecture, conducted a study in a hospital over several years with post-surgery gallbladder patients treated in the, by the same surgical team, the same nursing staff. Patients had relatively equal health and age and they all had the same size room but the rooms either had a view to a brick wall or they had a view to a cluster of trees. And those in the room with the trees, uh, with the view to the trees had shorter hospital stays, required less pain med medication, had less complaints and had uh, quicker healing and gave the hospital and staff better reviews. So hospital administrators and interior designers of hospitals latched onto this concept. I mean, better reviews, what would a hospital want better reviews? Um, and started to create patient rooms and waiting rooms with natural colors, plants, pictures and sounds of nature. They realized the calming effects nature has on us as a patient and as a loved one waiting for news about a patient, right? And so the, uh, the next slide, that evidence-based research continues. Um, other research followed on college students, students studying for exams Students were asked to take breaks and view on their computer either photos of nature or cityscapes, art, people's faces, et cetera. They found that the students who viewed photos of nature during their study breaks perform better on exams. Nature clears the mind, generates a feeling of calm, optimism, and in this case, increased focus. Uh, there are many other studies that have been conducted along these lines. The Children and Nature Network routinely collects uh, studies examining the positive link to nature. And the research is ongoing today on this topic. And, but this isn't really a new concept. So next slide, what is horticultural therapy? And I think we can go to the next slide. So uh, throughout history, physicians have prescribed walks in the garden because they were non-threatening, peaceful places for people to relax and heal. They created stroll gardens, uh, walled gardens. And in the 1700s in US and in Europe, gardens and farms were recommended treatment for people that were in institutions. And the roots of horticultural therapy in the US were established in the early 19th century by Dr. Benjamin Rush. He was a physician who, recognized, who was recognized as the father of American psychiatry. 
Dr. Rush observed and documented the benefits of working with plants for his patients at his Philadelphia clinic. He found that field labor on a farm had curative effects on people who were mentally ill. His efforts and documentation led to the use of horticultural therapy as a treatment option for individuals with a variety of illnesses. So horticulture therapy programs today are uh, now commonplace at various facilities in this country and abroad. So um, I'm gonna just fix this here so I can read this slide. Okay, here we go. So these are different types of horticultural therapy. Um, and the first one is a therapeutic horticultural therapy, which is done with patient care teams in a healthcare setting, like a hospital or physical therapy facility. There are specific treatment goals and assessments for example, it could be somebody who is recovering from an accident or a stroke or has a chronic illness or chronic pain. It's helping them get back to living at home, to get back to a work life and independent living and becoming um, pain-free wherever possible. So horticultural therapy can also be a distraction for somebody who is in, uh, has chronic pain. There's also vocational programs and the goals are focused on training individuals to work in horticultural industry or to use horticultural activities to build uh, core work skills. And those can be found in schools, correctional facilities, residential or rehabilitation centers. And the third is, um, is a social uh, horticultural therapy program where the goals are focused on social interaction and general well-being through horticultural activities. So it's like an enrichment program and it can be found in community gardens, group homes, and uh, social centers. So the next slide. So I want to share with you an example of a vocational program um, and how I've used that uh, kind of horticultural therapy. At Brooklyn Botanic Garden, prior to the pandemic, we had a group of students with autism work in the education greenhouse one morning a week. And this program was in place for years and years, way before I was even, I even worked at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And from a vocational standpoint, the students were learning work-related skills, right? They're working cooperatively with each other. They're working independently. They're following directions, communicating with supervisors and peers, completing tasks. I wasn't privy to their individual education plans, but I learned over time the tasks that each student found challenging and the tasks that they were proficient at. So for example, if a student had a tendency to overfocus, giving them a pest management job, which is very focused and very detailed was ideal. They did a great job and were successful. However, I might also ask that same student to fill a seed tray with a hundred cells with soil, and that could be quite challenging. So they might be inclined to fill each cell individually, but over time with guidance, they learned a more efficient way to, to complete the task and thereby learning a new job skill. The students loved working with plants. They discovered many things about plants on their own. They enjoyed um, a spring, uh, uh, we had a spring working in the children's garden. They had a little plot of land and we grew some vegetables. Um, they grew them, they harvested them and they brought them home to school and made very delicious dishes, I hope. Another example on the next slide is uh, a social program uh, that I developed at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. It's a seasonal highlights memory program, which is uh, still going on. We did it virtually during the pandemic, but there's nothing like in person. Um, and it's for people with dementia and their caregivers. The goals for this enrichment program were to increase socialization for the person with dementia and the caregiver, right? It's very isolating um, being both. Um, uh, to de-stress and relax, which was provided by the breathing deeply during our walk through the garden and being in the moment. The program wasn't about helping somebody remember. It was about enjoying the time with others and the beauty of the plants and nature. Although you would be very surprised at the memories um, working with plants will bring up for people participating in memory loss. All of a sudden they'll start talking about when they were children, what plants they grew. If they had some kind of a connection with nature, sometimes that would, that would come out and they'd be able to share that with us. So, um, and the fourth thing was that we were able to create some new memories. We have them pot up a sensory plant to bring home. 
so that they and their caregiver or their families can have a new conversation uh, to maybe talk about the trip that they had at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, maybe learn how to take care of their plant and feel it and smell it. So the conversation is continuing at home. Great program, I love it. Um, and so the next slide is about who can benefit from horticultural therapy. So some other kind of programs um, using plants to benefit special populations are intergenerational programs, which are very beneficial for youth, uh, as well as for seniors working together. Amazing, things can happen. Uh, Thrive is a UK organization which helps people with developmental support needs in a community garden. And there's a vocational program at Rikers Island on their farm. So how can this help your students or even yourself? Hang on one second, I'm gonna take a little drink. <clears throat> so overall, we wanna help heal emotional stress and build self-esteem. And gardening provides many ways to do this. So first of all, gardening is very phys physical, right? Builds strength, stamina, and dexterity. It develops gross and fine motor skills. Uh, physical activities release endorphins, right? Which trigger positive feelings. Gardening is a way for students to interact with peers and adults in beneficial social ways. It also is an, op an opportunity to increase successes and able and enable a mastery of challenges through varied tasks that give students a sense of achievement and inclusion. Cognitively, gardening builds intellectual skills and gardening answers the, who am I and how do I connect with the world? Understanding the world and our place in it, understanding the interconnectivity of all living things on this earth. So important for all of us, gives us meaning to life. Overall, gardening builds a sense of accomplishment, enthusiasm for the future, understanding and appreciation of all living things. So to help enforce these benefits, think about some of the following when deciding on activities. And remember that these activities can be used with uh, people of all ages. I mean, anybody can participate in these. So choose activities that reflect the season so students and yourself can connect with the world around. Discuss what happens to plants in each season. Try to plant something for each season, which is really great in gardens. <clears throat> Have students prepare the garden for an upcoming season. I think that we talked about this um, yesterday in the session, which was really great because it was a month by month breakdown of your garden through the year. That's fabulous, that was so good. Um, and this is, you know, following on that and thinking about that in terms of the season. Um, enjoy a harvest, uh, leave seeds for local birds that don't migrate in winter. And remember that seasons reflect the cycle of life. I have to tell you, I think, and I've really felt this way this past year that the seasons are a miracle. They continue, especially in the Northeast where we have so, such severe seasons, you know, they really, the four seasons really happen. It is miraculous that they just continue happening regardless of what's happening in the world. I mean, our climate may be changing, but our seasons are just, and they're gonna happen regardless of what it is that we do. And honestly, when I'm really done with winter and all of a sudden there's spring and you have the, you know, the, the uh, snowdrops coming up and the uh, witch hazel and the camellias and, Things that you wouldn't think would be blooming in winter are all of a sudden now, you know, blooming. The hellebores are coming up. It's just really, it, gives, it just gives you such hope. It really is. And I know that I'm, uh, you all kind of have this experience and I'm excited about that. So let's move on. Sorry, I, I uh, get caught up in that. Uh, so the next one is sensory. So if possible, select some sensory plants like, um, uh, like our warm up exercise, you know, engaging our senses can have such a profound effect on us. Uh, and these are all important aspects to enhancing a student's experience. Use herbs and plants with different textures, fragrances, colors, shapes, even the sound of plants. What? What am I talking about? The sound of plants. Well, let me share with you my experience in nature. So uh, my daughter and I went to Japan a couple of years ago. And in Kyoto, we went to the bamboo forest, which is um, you know, bamboo on either side of a dirt road and you walk down this and the, 
the bamboo is soaring. It is huge. It's got to be like 75 feet tall and thick, thick branches. And uh, as you're walking and there's bamboo on either side, you start to hear something that's happening way off in the distance. And it sounds like nothing you've ever heard before. And it's getting louder and louder as, you know, as it's getting closer and you're walking toward it. And it sounds like, um, like clashing, like something breaking, like it was like thunder, but not really thunder. It was the sound of bamboo banging against each other in the wind, in the breeze. It was, it was just phenomenal. It was a cacophonous sort of experience that really, um, it, it was beautiful. It was beautiful and scary at the same time. But anyway, that was my, that was my sensory experience. So you can make music uh, with plants, right? You have seed shakers and pods and gourds and, just do all kinds of things. And if you have a lot of bamboo together, bang them. Uh, that would be really lovely too. So incorporate a lesson on why plants have different colors and smells. What is, why, why do they, what does that mean? Explore the connection between pollinators and flowers. And this again, demonstrates how we're all connected. So our next slide is about uh, creativity. So be creative in your garden like plant some vegetables if you can harvest uh, to cook or make a salad, share your favorite recipe, have kids share their cultural or traditional dishes that they enjoy. See if you can make some of those plant themed beds like a pizza bed, you know, with basil and eggplant, whatever it is that you put on a pizza, tomatoes, maybe get some wheat uh, or a salsa bed. That's always fun. Uh, save plant catalog, uh, catalogs with photos and make collages, um, write plant stories, press flowers, make instant collages with plant materials. So this is really fun. So if you have a lot of, um, if you can collect a lot of plant material, flowers, different kinds, leaves, different kinds, roots, stems, bark, whatever you have, put it on a table, have the kids around the table with maybe a tray or a piece of paper and have them pull some of the plants together and uh, parts together and put them on a piece of paper in a, in a pattern maybe, or some kind of abstract design, go around and look at them, you know, enjoy each other's and then empty that, you know, they're not pasted down. They just put on the paper. They're not glued down. So just put them, you know, in the middle again and do it all over again, which is a, a really nice activity because it talks about the impermanence of life, that it's about the process. It's not about the final result. And you can really think about not making things perfect, but making things beautiful. So creativity fosters mental growth. It encourages new ways of thinking and problem solving. And it can also be an avenue to express one's feelings, which can be very helpful during this time. Create something to give to somebody else. It's a beautiful way to build empathy and caring. Everybody loves a plant-based gift, right? Absolutely. And so the next slide is about uh, multimodal activities. So incorporating a variety of, way, of ways that students can express themselves in the garden. So gardening is very kinesthetic, right? It's very tactile, we're weeding, we're turning soil, planting. But you can also do some garden yoga, you can dance. Um, you can also build some communication skills like having students listen and share having students present to each other the results of a plant experiment, a plant story, or a favorite plant. Uh, Shakespeare was an avid gardener. He referenced plants in all of his works. Um, have students write stories or poems about plants. Visual learners might like to track statistics like how many plants, how many pounds of tomatoes, how tall, plant colors, a number of, uh, and the variety of pollinators that visit different colored flowers. Multimodal activities includes everyone and builds self-esteem. Everyone is unique and everyone has something to share and everyone can be successful. We should incorporate stewardship uh, into uh, some of the activities. So that's the next slide. So our youth know what's happening to the earth and it would be very empowering for them to get involved in saving the earth. Uh, it could be creating a recycling campaign, making posters that educate others, writing letters, having a debate about climate issues, especially older youth, they love to debate about things. Um, 
some indoor plant activities like reusing containers like we have here in this picture. We have a juice container that's a little herb garden. You can uh, use plastic uh, soda bottles to make terrariums. Those are good winter things to do. Um, students can influence and make a difference. What you love and appreciate, you will try and save. So help them to love and appreciate the environment and nature. Now, I know that you've been hearing many gardening tips over the past couple of days, but I'm just gonna share mine and, um, and hopefully you can, uh, you can enjoy some of my, my favorite gardening tips. Um, so select plants that have a good track record. Try not to use old seed. If you have to, make sure that you use several seeds in one pot or one tray to ensure germination. Um, you can always thin them later. I know I hate to thin, but sometimes you just have to do it. Um, if you save seed from fruits or plants that grow, be aware that some seeds, uh, some plants are genetic, genetically modified to produce sterile seed. So if you can, test them beforehand, before your students do, or set up an experiment and have students predict outcomes. Also plan in advance before you make plant selections. So how much care do they need? Assess what your space is like in terms of light and heat, available water. I don't know how many uh, teachers have put plants on windowsills and because they have such great sun but they also have the heater that's below it. They radiate below it. And you know, plants can wither and die over weekends. Um, so taking note of that, uh, acknowledge and check in on plants every day. Have students observe how they're growing. Identify problems, too dry, too sunny, too wet. Inspect leaves for pets. These are really great activities for kids to do, but have them touch base with their plants every day if possible. Incorporate problem solving into the observations. So what do you think? we should do with this plan, have them figure it out. Whether you're gardening inside or outside, create a rotating schedule with jobs and student names that changes weekly or monthly. You know, there's so many jobs, weeding, watering, pruning, sweeping, washing pots, observing, turning soil, drawing. There's so many things you can do in a garden. And the next is, um, is about successes and challenges. So activities should really be a mix of things that, and we've talked about this because I really am, you know, really uh, a, an advocate of making sure that kids feel successful, but they're also challenged. So uh, activities should be a mixture of each. Um, so things that students like to do and, and are good at, and those that are more challenging. So uh, perhaps at the end of the day, um, try ending with something positive, like maybe a group uh, garden roundup and each student shares a success. Uh, think about some long and short-term activities like planting bulbs in the fall for blooms in the spring, um, collecting seed from plants in the fall to save for the following season. You can also dry herbs. Think about experiments like plant propagation or uh, multiplying plants through stem and leaf cuttings, which is also a very good winter activity. Many tropical house plants can be propagated through stem cuttings and leaf cuttings. They can do a plant sale if they get enough happening. Um, and the next slide is about uh, working as a, in a team or working alone. So you wanna create opportunities for students to work both in a group and also to work alone. Um, take note of the students who may prefer working alone and those that might like to work on a team or in pairs. Gardening is good for team building. It's also good for students to have ownership, a plant that they alone are responsible for. Also, I like to uh, record student questions and interests on a sheet, um, you know, a big uh, sheet of paper call, and I call it the potting shed. And it's always up and it's always available to read and to add to any questions that students might have. But also students are encouraged to maybe answer some of those, uh, those uh, questions, maybe uh, sharing what they've observed or what they've researched. So that's really nice. Um, on a side note, um, while the pandemic was very isolating, being back at school or work in person can be very difficult for some students and colleagues, especially those that feel socially awkward and might feel more anxiety being back in person. Maybe students need to be gently reminded about social skills. It's just something to be aware of that, you know, we're all back and some of us are really happy, but some of us are feeling some anxiety about that also. I like to have some silent meditative moments. Um, I like to have a talkless task time, which is 
hard to say. But I like to ask students to work quietly, <coughs> excuse me, for about <clears throat> five to seven minutes, although seven minutes is kind of long. Even five minutes is long for students, but if you can, have them work quietly alone um, while they read, plant, draw, or sit and quietly observe uh, plants. Creating peaceful times in the garden to listen to nature, to think, to have private thoughts. And on a related topic, some kids feel very comfortable talking to plants before talking to people. And sometimes they do it to gather their thoughts before sharing with a friend or an adult. But, and plants, you know, are a source of love and nurturing, right? Especially for kids who can't have pets. So sometimes they're plants, they become very attached to them. It's a living thing. And um, have fun with your plants and with your kids. Make it a joyful experience as often as you can. Encourage students to be curious and resourceful. Empower them to find answers by observing, discussing, researching. Learn from your students, you know, let them be the experts. Um, gardening is a, is a level playing field. We are all students in the garden. I learn every day that I'm when, with my plants, either they're at home or in my garden. Um, but celebrate successes together and have fun yourself. Have a garden party at the end of the season. Harvest and have a salsa or salad making competition. Have a plant material fashion show. Awfully fun. This is very fun. Or a recycled material fashion show. That's good for stewardship. And um, finally, one more thought. The last point I'd like to make is that Plants are living things, and unfortunately, all living things die at some point. As far as plants go, sometimes they die as part of their plant cycle, like annuals that live for a year in our climate. But sometimes plants die before their time for some unknown reason. And this could be very upsetting for children. But it could also be a learning experience, right? Learning to accept disappointment and the frustrations and these frustrations as part of life. It's good to get ahead of this by showing students the plant cycle and what to expect from their plants that they're growing. Sometimes plants die because the conditions weren't right, maybe too much sun, maybe not enough water. So experiment um, with another of the same plant and see if different care will help and help the plant live longer. Sometimes there are lessons to be learned, but sometimes there aren't. Sometimes we don't know why plants die. It's the mystery of life and we have to accept it. And it is an important lesson for students and for all of us. It's really all part of nature. But what can you do with the plant that has died? And there are, uh, perhaps there's a seed to save, you can press flowers, you can compost it. If you have a compost pile, examine what's in compost, living beneficial insects doing their job. You can talk about what happens when we compost. And compost is really the beginning and the end of the plant cycle, right? So we put on beautiful compost, uh, a compost to help our plants grow. And then we put our uh, plants at the end of the season, season into our compost pile so that we make wonderful soil again. This is great stuff. So uh, finally, I want to um, thank you all for joining today. And I hope that this information was helpful in connecting you and your students to plants and nature in a very meaningful way. Gardening is a gift. It's a way for all of us to connect to nature and plants and feel hopeful and optimistic. So thank you. All right, thank you, Joanne, uh, for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. Um, excuse me, from all of us with the school gardens team, we wish to Thank you for spending your time with us and for all these, with all these gardeners to introduce us to the world of court therapy, um, sharing concrete practices that we can take to our own gardening as well as students, caregivers, elders. Um, actually, Laura, if you go back to the reference material, I'll just mention it. Um, we have these two slides of reference materials for further exploring if you wanna do a deeper dive. This one has books, the next one has websites and organizations. Um, and so you will get this as part of the follow-up in the recording and the slides as well. You'll get a copy of the slides so you can don't seriously have to take notes right now for all of these um, on all of these sites. Um, so I guess with that, I'd like to open up for questions. And I do know um, one in the chat was 
written a while back from Ashley about specifically, are there horticultural therapy opportunities in the city? And Ashley, I assume you mean New York City specifically? So um, as far as working, like working as a horticultural therapist, I'm assuming that's what, what we mean. I am not sure. Ashley, do you wanna clarify? If you can type. Um, like it, it could, Yes. Okay. Okay. okay great. So, um, so I did my certificate program at NYPG, and they have sort of a network. They always uh, post positions, and you have to do an internship. So that really is helpful because they'll help you find ways to do that. There are like NYU Langone has a horticultural therapy program um, that's really terrific. A lot of schools um, have horticultural therapists. Um, rehabilitation centers do. Um, there are uh, programs that are in assisted living, I'm finding, because actually I'm trying to, uh, you know, find opportunities to work with people um, who are seniors with um, dementia. And um, I find that there are a lot of assisted living facilities, even in the city, that have gardens now. And I'm not sure that they actually know what to do with them, other than, you know, they may plant a couple of things. But or oh, have people plant a couple of things, but there's so much more, as you all know, that you can do with, uh, with plants. So um, hard to find. And I would say that you would, you might want to join the AH, AHTA, which is the American Horticulture Therapy Association, and the, uh, which is also on the bibliography, the, the uh, resources, the um, uh, Mid-Atlantic Therapy Network, because they also post jobs that, um, that are available at different, you know, different areas, but you might find something in New York City as well. The horticultural therapy uh, certificate at NYBG was really, it took me quite a few years, but it was really terrific. I mean, they talked about working with all different kinds of populations and um, all the things that horticultural therapists can do. Awesome. Um, I know there's another general question about can this information be included in the follow-up email? And I know, I'll just reiterate, you'll get a copy of the recording of the presentation, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. Um, and then the copy of the recording actually takes you to a blog post, which will have some hyperlinks to some of the very specific resources that are on these resource slides. So yeah, you will get this information tomorrow. Um, and I know two participants keep um, are raising their hands. So I don't... Um, Colleen, I have a question, but don't know how to ask it because I don't have Q and the Q and A option here. Oh, um, can I ask, um, yeah. Joanne? Thank you so much. Um, a lot of the tips you shared um, seem to be children focused. I'm wondering if these translate just as well with adults. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, I think they do, and I've used a lot of these activities with um, older adults. Um, I've used them with, um, with some of our school programs, as I mentioned, but with youth, like older kids as well. Um, I mean, you know, we all know the benefits of working in a garden and working with plants. So I think that you can use any of these activities with just about any age. I definitely agree. Um, and Brigida has asked if we'll have a Part two on um, what plants we can go for medicinal therapy. Um, I would say at the moment that's not in the works, but that could be future. But Joanne, I don't know if you could, um, if you have some off the top of your head plants that could be grown. So, um, um, so uh, plants that I missed that. What was the question? Oh, for medicinal therapy. So, um, medicinal therapy. So, I'll tell you, um, I'm going to give you like a warning because there are a lot of plants that, um, that, are, that could have medicinal properties for a variety of conditions. I mean, certainly we have our citrus with vitamin C, but there are some that actually do a little bit more than that. You have to be very careful with what plants you decide to, and what you know, sort of seeds or fruits you decide to incorporate into your, um, into your routine, because some of them could have adverse effects with whatever medications that you are taking. So you should always check with your doctor beforehand. Um, I've heard of, you know, oh, it's natural. It's, you know, it is natural, but it might 
counteract with something that's going on in your body. So you should, before you ingest anything, you know, other than like, you know, regular teas and herbal teas are great. Chamomile and lavender is, is wonderful for helping to sleep. Um, there are uh, uh, so many plants that have um, antioxidants like, you know, garlic and onions and uh, plants that are just really good to eat. But, you know, anything that you do, do it in moderation. Um, that's so that moderation and make sure you check with your doctor before you. So I, I don't give any information about, and I don't really have any information about medicinal plants. I know that there are plants that have health benefits. I'll uh, add on to that. We did a workshop a little while ago. It's on our grownyc distance learning.org about natural remedies. And we also have the same disclaimer of do it in moderation, test it out, check with your doctor, but it's more about how, like what kinds of herbs in the garden can you make a tea out of and um, things like that, kind of similar. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. There are a lot of edible flowers, you know, like your nasturtiums and your, your marigolds that have mm -hmm. a lot of vitamins in them. So great, even some weeds, oh my God, purslane and, you know, lamb's quarters, mm -hmm. you know, although we're trying to get rid of them out of the garden, they really, you can make a salad with them. So, um, so that's something to do, to think about. There's a yeah. lot of material out there, a lot of books, um, a lot on the internet. Well, the internet, you know, but there's a lot of books. And if you're going to go to an internet site, make sure you go to like an EDU or, a, you know, a, you know, a um, .org, you know, where it's something that is not a .com, where they're trying to sell you something, but that you're getting real, viable information. Uh, um, any more questions? Did I miss any um, that were posed in the chat versus in the Q&A? Any other queries? And Car hi, Tara. Tara is saying that um, Brooklyn Botanic has a really nice library on these topics as well. So that's a good resource um, as well. But I think we got all the questions, Colleen and Julian. Great. Yeah. Well, that means that I covered everything. That's wonderful. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, I was thinking it was very thorough. Um, so thank you. Yeah. I, wanna, I would like to uplift something that somebody put in the chat because I resonated with it. I think it's... Um, Valerie said, that was awesome, Joanne, and it was a healing moment in itself. I oh. felt that way too, Joanne. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. And actually putting it together, I, I really felt that same way. I thought, oh, this is, everybody knows this, but it's something that you just have to be reminded of. Um, just how wonderful and just where to go to feel hopeful, especially these days where there's just so, so much craziness going on. Mm -hmm. And also, I really just enjoyed my window is open, so the gentle rainstorm surprised me <laughs> just a few minutes ago, but I was like, oh, it's like very cozy right now to listen to Julianne speak and hear the raindrops. Oh, wow, it's really good. This just lovely atmosphere, at least in my um, unair conditioned room. <laughs> it is coming down, wow. Oh, there's a question, what is BBG? Yes, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. So that's short New York speak of our botanic garden. Um, Laura, if you hop forward. Okay, um, so I just wanna remind folks to tune in tomorrow um, for our last and fourth and final um, workshop for this Beginner Gardener series. Um, DK, who's one, been one of our co-hosts, she will be leading that with Chantal Gardens at Community Hubs. So I think that will actually really pair nicely with all of our offerings this year, some very garden specifics, but healing in the garden and community really is also a very healing, powerful healing component that we are all needing at this moment. So I feel like specifically today and tomorrow's um, offerings pair quite nicely together. So I hope you tune back in for four o'clock at Friday. And, um, and if you have any specific questions that we didn't get to today, or you think of something later, please feel free to email us and we will absolutely respond um, to you. 
Oh, wait, one last question before we go. Um, does BBG have drop-in school programs and what does that entail? So great question. Um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden has um, self-guided programs. So if, uh, if you'd like to bring your class, you can go online and, um, and just uh, select um, you know, a time so that you can get a, a pass to come in and bring all your students. So that you can do that self-guided. They also have programs um, which are virtual as well as um, in person. Uh, we're back to in person again this year, which is really nice. But um, their season is almost over. I think they have the last two weeks for programs, but you can always come self-guided with your class. And then the programs start again in the fall, the virtual and the, uh, um, and the guided programs. And of course, self-guided is always, so you can come through the summer as well. Um, so if you go to bbg.org slash, slash education, you'll be able to um, see all of the programs that are available. Uh, yes, thanks, Kara, for clarifying. Programs oh, yeah. are paid, self-guided trips are free. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Kara. Kara is a big BBG um, cheerleader. <laughs> Super. Um, <laughs> great. Well, if there's no final questions, um, again, Joanne, thank you for spending the hour with us and um, bringing Thanks this very call. Me. Thanks yeah. for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. So thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great time. Hopefully you stay dry. It's still raining. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.